over the weekend, I was in Allentown, Pennsylvania with Don Wassell of the uh, American Nationalist Union. He has changed the name of his group to the uh, American Freedom Union. And so they had a conference in Allentown over the weekend, and I delivered a paper on um, Albania. Now, why Albania? Albania is probably the world's most, probably the world's least significant country. It's probably the most unstrategic place in the world. How is Albania going to manifest? How is it going to show itself? It has no strategic importance. No one even knows where it is. Um, if it disappeared tomorrow, no one would notice. So how does Albania show itself, show its, its strength to the world? Well, what it did was go to the New World Order and say, we will, in our small way, fight Russia through Serbia. Well, in fighting Serbia, we'll be fighting Russia. And the New World Order said, kind of condescendingly, okay. Now, what that meant was that anything that Albania and, of course, Kosovo, as well as Albanians in um, uh, Macedonia do, is now completely covered over by the Western press. They will get financial and military aid without any reference to how it's spent, or if there is even any, any chance of a loan getting paid back. They'll be lied about in the international press. They'll be seen as almost saintly figures. The thesis of my paper really was that if you're a, a criminal gang that runs a country, or if you're a deeply corrupt politician, your only real recourse is to go to the U.S., go to, the, go to Brussels, go to the New World Order, and say, we will fight Russia for you. And if you do that, it doesn't matter how disgusting you are, you will be supported. And so I wrote this paper proving that point. What group internationally is the most nauseating? Now, there's a lot to choose from, but I would say, for me, it is the KLA. It is the uh, pseudo-nationalist groups in Kosovo, uh, the Albanian groups there under um, American CIA control. And I say that because, apart from being this very minor footnote to the New World Order's fight against Russia, Albania has a distinction of being the only country in the world whose economy is entirely based on heroin and prostitution. This is their big export. They don't make anything else. They have no interest in making anything else. This is what they do. Albania has decided to assert itself on the world stage by becoming the hub of heroin coming from the American-occupied parts of northern Afghanistan and acting as a trans uh, transport center for uh, Central Europe, Western Europe, and uh, America. That's how it decided it was going to approach the world. So I wanted to talk about Albania in this respect because it, it's indicative of something very powerful. Um, essentially, you know, Albania was created in the 1870s by, at a dinner party, of the um, Austrian elite in Bosnia. Because the policy concern at the time was how do we stop Serbia from A, connecting with, Montene uh, with um, Montenegro, and B, uh, having regular access to the Adriatic. And Albania was the solution to both. Albanians are a, a non-national people. They're, they're a tribal people. There's nothing wrong with them as such. But they were kind of cobbled together into this nation. They called it Albania for some reason, and um, it... it followed the, the border that the Austrian want, Austrians wanted that was most effective to fighting Serbia. That's its entire purpose. Um, and it's mostly Islamic, as you know, but it's Islamic. You know, remember, th these people converted to Islam because they realized that it was easier than paying the double tax that Christians um, had to pay. You know, Montenegro, these people were usually killed on sight. These were traitors. These were these were frauds. These were less. They were less than men. They cared more about you know money and prestige than they did about the faith. So they were considered a very low class of people. So the Muslims in, in the Balkans 
uh, not them personally today, but but their descendants um, were the lowest of the of the Balkan peoples. They were the cowards who, under Ottoman occupation, other than pay the double tax and everything else, decided they were going to become Islamic. And of course, since Albania had long since um, made the claim under the communists that it had wiped out religion, um, a lot of native Albanians really were very inexperienced in being Muslims. So whatever they, whatever they're practicing now, God knows what kind of a mess it is, theologically speaking. Uh, but you know, nothing has changed today. Albania today, rather than the creation of Austria, is a creation of the U.S. Rather than Islamic uh, oligarchs, it's say a collection of petty crime lords. In both cases, it's a bizarre artificial entity created exclusively to fight the Slavs, to fight Russia. Uh, through fighting their allies in Montenegro and Serbia. Um, now, privatization, as, as it was after the fall of the communists in 1991, um, was a complete disaster. But Albania was particularly nasty. Albanian communism uh, tried to follow the, the methods of Mao and was far more extreme and thorough than, than the Soviet Union. Albania, again, in its constant attempt to, to be something in the world, to, manifest, to, to let people know that it actually exists. It had to, it had to make itself distinct, and, and what it did was it had to outdo the Soviet Union. It was going to be more communist than Lenin, and the only way to do that is to go to Mao. And so it became this little outpost of China um, in the Balkans. Well, privatization in Albania was eccentric because it took the form of a group of small um, petty, petty crime lords creating a pyramid scheme. When businesses were privatized, the population, citizens received their portion of its value in a voucher. That was the theory in the Soviet Union and elsewhere. It never worked. It was very, very easy. There were people who were born and raised under Marxism. They had no idea how to manipulate currency, how to, how to, how to deal, um, how to think in these terms. But, of course, uh, the Jews especially had always thought in these terms. And very quickly, possessed all of these vouchers. It was a total disaster. And of course, all of these enterprises were so radically undervalued that the voucher was useless anyway. But Albania, their uh, crime lords are now institutionalized, both in Albania and in Kosovo. And this is how they got their, their start. Um, the pyramid scheme, as you know, um, you, you promise a high yield uh, you know, a bond, for example, that's very high yielding, um, or way artificially high, and the the interest rate artificially high, and then, but in order to support that, you need to go hire people to subscribe to this, and then they have to hire more people, and then they have to hire more people, and the more liquidity they have, the bigger the return is going to be. So that's that's the essence of a pyramid scheme. Um, of course, there is no such bond, and you know Albanians had no way of knowing that. Nor did they understand what a pyramid scheme was. Um, remember, in Eastern Europe, uh, when communism fell, these places were flooded with, with Westerners. Scam artists of all kinds, uh, Protestant evangelicals, Mormons. Um, the Jews came up out of, the, out of, um, out of their hiding places and, and, um, and created entire governments. And in Albania, these tribal chiefs reasserted themselves as... Uh, drug dealers, um, uh, pimps, which is really their big, their big thing, and you know, to destroy this this privatization idea, the pyramid scheme was their particular, and almost the entire economy was dealt with this way. The government participated in the scheme, but they did not create it, and really, it was a complete ignorance of of how you function in a market economy, even though it never actually was a market. But this is a this is a no man's land between Maoism on the one hand and what they thought was Western capitalism on the other. It had nothing to do with with, with either really. And of course, there is no bond, there is no uh, security that gives these high yields. You have all these subscribers, you have all this money, and then you take off. And given the nature of Albania, you know, there's no roads worthy of of, of note. Very few cars. Uh, transportation is, is non-existent. Uh, only a handful, even today, have phones. You know, uh, uh, it's very easy to get away with it. Um, so, um, strangely enough, the IMF 
uh, had had a role in this. The International Monetary Fund had tried to redirect the rage of the population against the crime lords and to the state. The state was not involved, really. This was a strictly private private matter. Um, it was odd that the, the violence was, was launched against the police department and government buildings, as if they were the ones who came up with the pyramid scheme. I have the feeling that the IMF had kind of generated this notion that this is a this is a this has something to do with government because they're used to a government that was responsible for everything, but the government was not responsible for anything. And what occurred um, were riots, um, le re leading right up until 1997, that overwhelmed the police force, which was only semi-existent anyway, and the army, which we'll talk about here in a minute, which really wasn't an army, and that's that's quite deliberate. Um, and then what what happened? Uh, 93, 94, 95. All the military magazines were looted, and crime gangs became institutionalized in the society. This is what democracy and the free market mean to Albanians. The economy, at least the formal economy, collapsed, and yet everyone was told to look to the state as a solution to a problem that they didn't create in a value system that had nothing to do with government. By 1997, the, elect, the, the currency had lost 25% of its value in just a few weeks. 10% of the country's GDP was gone. Monthly level of income was about $18. And the state was now essentially three or four major gangs led by the, um, uh, led, well, led by the, the Gakai, which were the main, uh, main group. Um, and human trafficking and drugs uh, were the mainstay of their, of, their, um, of their public policy, so to speak. Now, the way that the IMF and the World Bank dealt with this. They, they, they were quite aware of what was going on, but they had to treat Albania as if it was a real government and a normal society because they had long since decided that they were going to throw their lot in with the IMF and the World Bank and therefore were going to be the, the enemy of the Serbs and the Russians. This made them very, very useful, at least locally. And so you have, um, here's, here's a quote from um, the IMF concerning uh, Albania at this time. Get, this is really, this is, this is, I know that Jarvis is laughing as he's writing this. This is the kind of diplomatic language they had to use. The quote, there were also governance problems, both in the financial sector and more generally. The regulatory framework was inadequate, and it was not clear who had responsibility for supervising this informal market, end quote. Informal market, regulatory framework, you know, it, it's a tongue-in-cheek. They knew, as everyone did that the informal market was the market. Um, you know, the informal sector, by definition, is not supervised by it. He, he had this stupid comment here that, that is that Professor Jarvis had, had written this for the IMF. Who had responsibility for supervising the informal market? This is a very stupid statement, since informal markets, by definition, have no super, super supervisor. That's what makes them informal. Black markets are have no supervision, and that's what makes them black markets. But the U.S. government and NATO was involved in financing all of this. And all of this was done with full knowledge that um, the regulatory framework was inadequate. Um, so the banking sector in Albania in the 90s was nothing more than a means, so it's a big safety deposit box for some of these, um, for the pyramid schemes and for the gangs that eventually came out of it. So um, listen to this quote. It, this is from the State Department's uh, Investment Climate in, in Albania. Um, which came out in, in 2015. Quote, Albania's banking sector weathered the financial crisis better than many of its neighbors, largely due to its lack of exposure to international capital markets and domestic housing bubbles. End quote. Now, you don't need to be an economist to realize that, that was an insult. It weathered the financial crisis. This is how they have to write about the country. I mean, it's a benefit. You, you decide to fight for the New World Order. This is what you're going to get. It weathered the financial crisis better than its neighbors. Well, because its neighbors actually have a financial sector. But then they say, this is because they have no exposure in international capital markets, and they don't have domestic housing. So they can't have a domestic housing bubble. I mean, it's extremely funny, and there's no question that the people were, were laughing as they were writing this. Because the banking sector doesn't do anything, of course it's going to survive the... the um, Meltdown very well. There's nothing to melt down. If the bank is only only just uh, you know a criminal uh, a safety deposit box, and there is no domestic housing credit 
or domestic housing, of course, the housing bubble elsewhere in the world is not going to affect Albania. I mean, this is, you know, this is, a level, this is how far they have to go to defend this situation. It is so irrelevant. The banking sector is so irrelevant to the world economy that, of course, it will be unaffected by the chaos. It's almost a parody. Now, the government is made up of these, to this day, made up of the gangs that really came to prominence in the riots that destroyed the government um, when the pyramid schemes collapsed in the mid-90s. Now, Brussels and the State Department, um, Western European governments, they get promises from the quote-unquote Albanian government that they will clamp down on corruption. And on the strength of that promise, this is the same in, in Ukraine, by the way, on the strength of that promise, they get millions of dollars in loans and loan guarantees. Now, there is no government. They can't promise anything. And it is the very definition of corruption. You see, when you, when you want to reform a corrupt society, the implication is, the assumption is, that there's a sector, that there's a part of the society that is not corrupt, that then can be used to purify all the rest of it. But in Albania, there is no such thing. That's the case in many places. You know, Ukraine is, is a prime example. Ukraine is the exact uh, image of, of Albania. I mean, it has somewhat of an economy and is not entirely based on drugs and prostitution. Uh, but it's the same idea. They threw, their, they threw in their lot with the New World Order, and therefore they get money you know, just for existing. So long as they continue to fight Russia, they can do whatever they want. The IMF, the World Bank, they're giving money to these criminal institutions. This is nothing more than if, you know, a major drug gang took over the U.S. government and ran it um, just as their own uh, private bodyguard. It, it's no different than that. They're not governments in a normal sense of the word. So um, this is where this money is being sent to. And to call it a government is mystification. But because they promised to fight Russia, which is the only enemy right now in the world, according to the New World Order, it is the only enemy. Anything else is fine. They will do. They will. They will they, the U.S. has already allied with Al Qaeda in uh, Al Qaeda in in the Middle East to fight Russia. They don't. Whatever. They will do anything to fight Russia. That's how panicked they are. It's the same thing with Trump in the United States. They'll destroy him. They, it doesn't matter what they have to do, what lie they have to tell. Everyone knows the polling data make no sense whatsoever. Only eleven percent of the population trusts Hillary Clinton, but. She's beating Trump in the election. It doesn't make sense. If it doesn't make sense, it can't be true. The state, however, uh, the American State Department, however, admits that all reform attempts in Albania have been a failure. Like that was unexpected. So the report, um, the State Department, the very same uh, investment climate statement, Albania, June of, 19, uh, June of 2015, it says, quote, despite all of these amendments, they're referring to promises of reform. No high-level officials have been successfully prosecuted for corruption. And even more, it goes on to say this. Although the number of corruption cases investigated is rising, conviction rates remain very low. High-level corruption cases of politicians or well-connected businessmen are very rarely do they, do they end in conviction. Perception of corruption continues to be high, and Albania ranked 110th, the last in Europe, out of 174 countries in the Transparency Index, um, Transparency, Tra Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. I'm sure it's far lower than 110, but it was the most corrupt in Europe. It is corruption. It's not, it, it's not, it's not the most corrupt. There is no government there. there. There is no normal government there. It is corruption by definition. So to, to make, you know, it, it's not uh, a, a percentage of it is corrupt. It is corruption. The entire thing, it's not a normal government. So it's a stupid statement to begin with, but they know that they, they know this as they're uh, stating this. They know how idiotic it is. So Albanian society has become incredibly debased here. Now, the citizenry, they don't see, and the, the, one of the worst parts of this, um, the citizenry says in poll after poll, the State Department has commissioned these that there is no hope of reform. Now, after after saying all this about Albania, the State Department then says. Quote, Albania is a source of stability in the region, and it maintains friendly relations with all neighboring countries, end quote. I'm going to give you a second to let that sink in. They're at war with every single country near them. They've exported, uh, you know, terrorist groups like the KLA, whatever. You know, this is what the State Department has to say. 
This is what you do when a criminal uh, gang that has a country attached to it, that occupies a country, decides that it will side with you against Russia. You are then a source of stability. These people are getting hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to write this stuff, you know, and I'm struggling. And give me a break. Everyone knows. There isn't a single uh, intelligence agency in Europe that doesn't say exactly what I'm saying right now. The German BND has been saying this for years. You know, and it gets worse. This is just the beginning. Um, whatever little development exists in Albania occurs in the capital city. And it's mostly in the black market and they're mostly estimates. There is absolutely no confidence in the system whatsoever. Albania is chronically short of basic stuff, uh, energy, um, all the necessaries of life. It is far worse off than North Korea in terms of electricity, for example. Now, the development, the, the so-called economic growth in the country, the claim is it's mostly in agriculture. Yet the country imports almost all of its food. So I'm not sure how they square that. There is no foreign direct investment at all. There's a few uh, projects from Italy. The roads are non-functional. The accident rate are the highest in Europe. You can't drive on these things. The nature of the, let me put it like this. 96% of all Albanian cars on the few roads that work are brand new, very late model, high-end Mercedes. So in other words, the U.S. has accepted that the mafia control Albania the Albanian government and political parties are Albania, and they've accepted this so long as they continue to fight against uh, Russia. About 7%, 7% of Albanians have telephones. Tax collection is non-existent, as institutions are financed through crime. From 1999 to 2007, there was not a single case of prosecution for corruption. Not even a, not even a showcase to show to the West. The country is really not monetized. The, the, the use of, of the lek is only for the sake of, of uh, drug deals. Half of the world's human trafficking comes from Albania or at least passes through it. 80% of, of Central Asian heroin goes through it. In 2016, 76% of the Albanian population said it was impossible, impossible for corruption to be fought. It's because this, this trade, if, if, if heroin is your main source of income, then yes, corruption is very difficult to fight. Um, unless another sector can be found that can compete with heroin in terms of quick money, which I really doubt, this will remain. So long as they are, they are dedicated to fighting Russia, uh, heroin is perfectly fine and acceptable. So they're receiving millions of dollars from the U.S. taxpayer, by the way. In Kosovo, just you know, these, these are Albanians as well, uh, you have two groups, the, the KLA and the ANA, both financed by the, by the Americans. They're pretty loud about they're, um, you know, it's, it's a macho thing to talk about how criminal they are. Um, the two, you know, there's Ramesh uh, Haranai and, and Hashim Thaki. Um, but Thaki uh, specializes really in drugs and human trafficking. Uh, Haranai uh, really is mostly into drugs and weapons. He smuggles cars, too, on occasion. Um, uh, some of them, uh, they do on occasion deal with uh, some fuel uh, bootlegging. Uh, the UN, though, you know, agrees with everything I'm saying here. There's no difference, they say, between criminal and political groups in Kosovo or Albania proper. Um, in 1998, uh, Ibrahim Ragova, uh, my favorite, he was elected president of Kosovo in a one-party election where he received 99% of the vote. This was accepted as free and fair by the BBC, the US, and the BBC called him the father of the nation, and he won right after this the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought after this great victory of 99, 99.8% of the vote, actually, to be specific. Taki himself was given uh, similar honors, and it's right at the same time the BND German intelligence showed without question that all of these guys were deeply involved in heroin, in drugs, in girls, in fuel bootlegging, everything else. It didn't matter. They all agreed on one thing, that we're going to back the U.S. in the war against Russia. Therefore, it was okay. Saki actually was, it was shown, uh, there was a report by the Council of Europe that he was taking organs from Serbian POWs and selling them on the black market. Paul Lewis of the uh, UK Guardian says that the author of the report was threatened and he then retracted his paper. No one seemed to notice that. Immediately afterwards, uh, the US nominated Saki for a Nobel Prize, Peace Prize in 2014. 
There is no hope. In 2016, um, here, here's a quote that is just, it really, it's, it really starts to break your heart after a while. This is the quote. According to survey results, in 2016, the groups that are perceived as the most corrupt are judges, customs officers, prosecutors, administration officials, the justice system, political parties, and leaders of the ruling coalition. Results show that during the past two years, there has been no improvement for reducing the abuse of power by these groups. As, remain, as reported by the public, their level of involvement in corrupt practices remains very high. End quote. So let's do this list again. Judges, custom officials, prosecutors, administration officials, justice system, political parties, and leaders of the ruling coalition. That's everybody. Why would you list things if it's everybody? That's everybody with any power in the country. They're just listed there. Those are the people who are the most corrupt, and then they list everybody. It's how can it's anybody with any power whatsoever, but they list them out as if to say that there's some groups more corrupt than others. No, they say here's a list of people who are the core corrupt, and they say everyone. You know, I'm not sure people get paid for this. They list them, you know, they're they're giving the impression that there might be some groups there that are trustworthy. Uh, now listen to this. The same report here. They say, quote, even using the most diplomatic language, Albania remains almost entirely corrupt. All results presented do not indicate a positive situation about the aspects of corruption occurring and the extent of the involvement of public officials in corrupt practices. According to the perceptions of Albanian citizens, the future is not very bright. Four-fifths of Albanians consider corruption as highly possible and probable. Only 2% of them consider corruption pressure as rare. The same amount of respondents believe that Albanian government will not take any measures ever to reduce the level of corruption in the country. This means that citizens believe that any interaction they might have with public officials, they'll be subject to corruption." End quote. Now, in the, in the Balkanization of Politics, Crime and Corruption in Albania by Daniel Herrera, says more than half of the GDP comes from illegal activities. That's being very, very, very nice. She even admits that most of Albania is corrupt in the sense that the, the income that, that makes anything function there is from heroin, prostitution, and sometimes cars. Yet, with all this knowledge, the very same people who have written these things, who have okayed these reports, have just agreed to a 40 million euro loan package to the country. About two or three billion have been plowed into that criminal nation year after year from institutions all over the world. They know that they'll never see it again. They know it's total. For, they know that they're buttressing criminals. But because they're at war with Serbia, and have supported the American position in the Balkans 100%, they get away with it. They get this money essentially as payoff. And Ukraine is the exact same way. So it's not just Albanians here. Uh, the Ukrainian situation is absolutely identical. Now, believe it or not, I have yet to get to the worst part of it. There is no country like this in the world. Now, um, uh, one of the EU consultants uh, in Albania for um, legal reform is named Agron Adabali. He says that, um, well, I'll quote him here, quote, The current situation began in the early 90s after the country emerged from Marxism. One of the most controversial measures undertaken by the post-communist government was to select judges from among graduates of crash law school courses. You know, people with no training whatsoever led to a legal system infected with incompetence, partisanship, and corruption. This misstep was later corrected by establishing a magistrate school, a graduate level school initially funded by the Council of Europe. This may have improved the quality of future judges and prosecutors. It just led to a sense of entitlement for many, leading to the creation of a virtual caste system. I'll end the quote there. All right, do you hear that? The, the judges and lawyers were at, were at college level, crash courses, just a few, a few weeks, and you're a judge. Well, under a society like that, it kind of makes sense. But this is, a, the judiciary, this is called a judiciary system. My cat's here have the equal claim of being a judiciary system. They simply decided, you know, they, they took a couple of online core, I would have probably online at the time, but, uh, you know, uh, correspondence courses, crash law, they call them crash law courses right here. This is an official document here. And then they very, very nicely say that it, meant it led to uh, a, a incompetent and corrupt judicial system. But then the Council of Europe came and abolished those crash courses probably correspondence courses, no universities whatsoever, and created their own magistrate schools, which were actually law schools, um, you know, shortened versions of, of a European law school. All that did, 
was not create more competent lawyers and judges. It created another section of the oligarchy. Those who graduated those courses then were so arrogant, believing they had this secret knowledge of the law that no one else had, they actually formed themselves another class, another a sect of the ruling oligarchy. So even when you have a legitimate reform like that, the people who were so reformed then take it and use it as a way to oppress other people. So a legitimate law school is created for a while. Uh, people come out of it, uh, graduate. Um, I guess it's a legitimate law school, you know, in, in the sense that we use the term. And the result is um, that they consider themselves a, a caste, uh, a, new, a new oligarchy. But to this very day, the State Department refers to these people as judiciary, that corruption is being fought there, that there are cases uh, being prosecuted. Every single person who knows anything about this knows that to prosecute corruption in Albania means that uh, one crime group gets to get rid of its disloyal members or uh, gets rid of rivals. And that's what the prosecution for corruption is. The very same guy, this um, Agar Alibaba, says the exact same thing. Um, he says that um, internal judicial structures, in most cases, they've been reluctant to suspend or expel from their ranks any judges accused of misconduct, misconduct or corruption of any kind. The Albanian Bar Association, which actually exists, has had very few disbarment cases for corruption among private attorneys, even when they had these crash courses. So for a few weeks, and maybe like you know, $100, you get to be a lawyer and a judge. Even there, you had no cases of being disbarred because there's no standards. This isn't exactly something that you can, I mean, even corrupt societies don't have this. This is almost a parody. But it does make sense when you have a, literally a criminal state, you know, criminal gangs who had taken over the government. What they require then, they build their own judges. And so they're not going to spend much money on law school, for crying out loud. So they, they create something, you know, a correspondence course to satisfy the, the donor country. They give them a diploma, and then they're set up in, a, in an office building, and they do what they're told. And then, you know, the Council of Europe creates something else, you know, somewhat like a law school, and it just means that they are more arrogant versions of the, of the criminal class. So, but in general, when a state says it's going to end corruption, whether it be in Ukraine or, or, um, uh, or in the U.S. for that matter, there are a few things that are impl implied. First, that the government is stronger than the corrupt entities, that they can impose the rule of law on them. So clearly in Albania or Ukraine, that's not the case. The state is the, the privatized criminal system. Secondly, that the state itself is not entirely corrupt. So if the state says we will reform ourselves and get rid of corrupt entities, they're saying that corruption really is an anomaly and most of us are good. And finally, those who are taking the money to reform are not themselves corrupt. Now the thing is, no one believes this when it comes to Albania. None of this is true. A typical Albanian in the street, as every poll shows, says that outside of violent revolution and military rule, nothing could ever change in the country. Uh, well, that reminds me. Military rule. I think at one point it occurred to the drug lords that having a strong army might be a problem. Because an army, oftentimes, is the only real organized patriotic organization in, in, a, in a country, especially a weak, poor country just getting started. If you're a, a drug and prostitution oligarchy, calling yourself Albania, you created judges and, and a legal profession that you can control. They're not even legal people. They, they, you know, they, they don't know anything. Um, you worry about an army. Even if you control it, one day, it's possible that a general or two may you know, decide they're going to take action. So they made sure that there was no army. Um, the riots in the 1990s show that the police, they immediately melted away. There are actually some heartbreaking scenes, if you've seen on YouTube, of rioters beating the crap out of, of policemen. I don't know why. I mean, the policemen didn't create this stuff. Riots don't make any sense. The cops, are well, they have nothing to do with, with these policies. And the army was never called because there wasn't one. The army, and I use that in quotes, it's pretty much just um, a very small um, side. Uh, they're really a bodyguard of the crime lords. They're, they're large enough to transport drugs through the country, but not large enough to actually do anything. Um, it has no tanks. 
It has no self-propelled guns or missile systems of any kind whatsoever. It doesn't have an air force. It has no military planes whatsoever. There are no fighters. There's no bombers. There are no attack helicopters. But they do have huge, brand new transport planes. Which makes perfect sense if you're a drug dealer. The transport system, that is highly advanced. No helicopters at all. Not even, not even you know, uh, from, for medical things. There is no Albanian army whatsoever. It is a handful of American, um, the big transport planes, uh, jets, uh, that are constantly going from, you know, Afghanistan uh, to Albania, then to points west, you know, for some reason. And that is called the Albanian army. It makes perfect sense there, too. You know, you can't have an army if you're a criminal state. That would be the one source of possible um, opposition that actually has the force to do something. There is no Albanian army of any kind. Uh, I think there are some guys in uniform, but they're simply the, the cousins, uh, you know, the, the, the retarded friends of, of, the, of the oligarchy. They're given a, 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 a you know, costume to wear, but they have, there's, no, there's nothing. Uh, not a single tank do they have. It's sometimes, and people think I'm exaggerating here, um, part of the, these pyramid schemes that developed in the 1990s a lot of the initial, really the purpose of it was to launder money. Um, one of the reasons that there will never be any victory in the American war on drugs is because drug money supports the stock market. Roughly a trillion dollars of liquidity a year go flying through there, being laundered. Now, back in the 90s, the U.S. could not afford to, to stop that uh, spigot. And it's far worse in Albania since that's the only economy that they have. Um, there are several papers... Uh, one by uh, Dr. Ilik uh, from Serbia, that arms smuggling has become very important uh, starting in 1992. Uh, and very, it's an underground economy, very expansive, and it has U.S. backing. Uh, the triangle, essentially, the triangular trade in oil, arms, and narcotics. And it developed because of the embargo on Yugoslavia at the time. Um, and then, um, given the embargo that was placed on Yugoslavia, it gave the Albanians in Kosovo the green light to violently cleanse the Serbs from Kosovo. Because Albanians don't know anything about an economy, uh, the unemployment rate in Albania was about 90% by the mid 90s And this is what, you know, to say the least, uh, exacerbates, exacerbated tensions. And remember, before this, the Yugoslav government had been subsidizing Kosovo and it had a kind of a normally functioning economy. But it was the Albanian government's policy, even while it was a Marxist state, to subsidize the birth rate and send the excess population into Kosovo. In, in, in 1920, the Kosovo population was like 8% Albanian. Uh, the KLA, which was a revolutionary group funded by the U.S., uh, using child soldiers, um, that, um, and, and he writes in here too, um, quote, a neighboring Albania, the free market reforms adopted since 91-92, created conditions which favored the criminalization of state institutions. Drug money was laundered in the Albanian pyramid schemes. They mushroomed during the government of former president uh, Salih Bersha. And these shady investment funds were an integral part of economic reforms inflicted by Western creditors on Albania, end quote. In other words, this particular report, and this comes from uh, a TMJ online, um, making fun of uh, Kosovo uh, uh, freedom fighters, it's called, this, you know, so, so clearly he makes a, a proof beyond doubt the CIA created the KLA and the ANA in Kosovo and hence were an extreme uh, uh, important part of the drug trade and fuel uh, bootlegging through that country. And of course today it continues uh, better than ever with the largest U.S. military base in the world right there, Camp Bonsteel, which seems to have no ability to stop any of this because it won't and it can't and it has no interest in it. So if you ever needed proof of the American uh, domination of the drug trade, its control of it, how it uses these, you know, unfortunates uh, to do its bidding, there you have it. Um, you know, if you're military personnel, this is what you're fighting for. You're going to die for this? 2010, the EU's rule of law mission, rule of law mission, uh, the acronym was ULEX, E-U-L-E-X, they investigated local leaders' uh, ties with organized crime. But, of course, they were aware that local leaders were organized crime. 
And of course, they came to the same conclusion that the IMF simply permitted the criminalization of the state because that was the best way to get quick cash to pay their debts. In other words, heroin was okay because you're anti-Russian, so it's, so it's automatically okay, but your quick cash um, is coming through Kosovo in this way, and therefore we get our money quicker. And that was okay. The KLA was financed through human trafficking, uh, drugs, and of course the American taxpayer. The German intelligence had long since uh, uh, knew this and had published numerous reports saying this was the case. Although I'm not sure, in 2005, the BND prepared a top secret report that was leaked to the media about how the KLA and the ANA, all the American um, front groups, were essentially drug leaders, dr drug lords. Now, I'm not sure why this had to be kept secret. The whole point of intelligence is that it's not kept secret. It had to be kept secret because it would have destroyed um, the, the American propaganda machine in the area. The German government sat on this, knowing that they were permitting um, the complete criminalization of the area and that the U.S., was in, in, instrumental in creating it. So the beaten up policemen, and yet it was the Americans and the IMF that created these institutions. So it's not like there's a belief that the KLA, um, you know, deals drugs and that the U.S. has is, is been financing it. it. It's it's clearly the case. I mean, every intelligence agency in Europe has published something on the matter, but doesn't really want to talk about it for some reason. It's amazing. This is the only area in the world where all of a sudden they don't want to talk about the, the crime problem here. Um, the National Child Labor Survey in Albania estimates that 57,000 children, almost 10% children uh, over five, are economically active. In other words, they're being forced to work. It's almost 10% the employment rate of children. Uh, they work about 20 hours a week. 40.9% uh, 40, 40 of children engage in unpaid household services. I don't want to know what that is. Then if you are 15, 16, it's almost 70%. You're working almost a full-time job. Uh, again, unpaid household services. God help us. Children um, are being used in some capacity there. And it will, will not get into the, the sex trade industry, uh, white slavery. Um, and these are all very, very uh, low estimates. The U.S. was putting tremendous pressure that either this not be released or um, that if it is released, you make sure that it makes us look as good as possible. But they couldn't. A young girl, 13-year-old girl, very popular in Europe, uh, in Albania, cost about as much as a used car. That's that's the U.S. State Department, and um, well, here's here's um, the State Department says this: um, the State Department uh, Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons, two th 2014 report, the country narratives, Albania says this: Government of Albania does not fully comply with the minimum standards for, for the elimination of trafficking. However, it is making significant efforts. To do this, the government appointed new anti trafficking coordinators who, in December of 2013, initiated the development of a special task force to improve coordination, police, prosecutors, and these judges. Albanian law enforcement approved its understanding of the victim centered approach to all this, though further training certainly is needed. I'm quoting this, but I can't, I can't, you know, I can't help but be sarcastic about it. The government increased the number of victims identified but prosecuted and convicted only a small number of trafficking offenders. Government refused to fund NGO shelters that provided services to victims of trafficking. Victims received inadequate mental health services in state-run shelters. Medical care staff needed training. End quote. In other words, everyone knows that the government is the group of people who are involved in this. NGOs now are at war with the U.S. government because they need Albania as, a, as an ally against Serbia. Therefore, they will not be condemned for the fact that they control, dominate half of the world's um, sex labor of children being uh, distributed throughout the world. Any effort whatsoever was being done by NGOs, not the Albanian government. The Albanian government is not involved at all because they're the target of it. And there's a handful. There's been one or two trials against uh, uh, enslavers with charges being dropped in every single case. It's about protecting an ally rather than the truth. So the, the, any, any legitimate NGO in the area who's fighting human trafficking realizes that they can't win because they're up against um, the U.S. that requires uh, Albanian 
cooperation outside of a total foreign invasion. There can't be a military coup because there isn't one. So how would this government be totally, the government would have to be totally wiped out in order for any reform to happen. Um, the UN clearly says uh, in um, the UN um, it's called the Kosovo, Europe's mafia state, hub of the EU NATO drug trail. Um, and then, of course, the, the uh, United Nations report uh, follows this very closely. Um, in Europe, Albanians made up 32% of all those arrested in Europe for drug charges. Uh, the next identified group were Turks, very close to Albanians, and then uh, followed by Italians. I bet you those Italians are of Albanian descent. And then citizens of Balkan countries, uh, which include Kosovo. <laughs> so in other words, they're all Albanians. So it's far so 32% is more like half, if that's the case. Then there's a few that are from Pakistan, Nigeria, arrested in this area as well, probably slaves themselves. The handful that the these judges, you know, these well-trained judges have, have tried to prosecute, all these charges have been dropped. They better. Uh, and all really the, these criminals do in, in Tirana is they send Brussels some numbers. They can make up a case. They'll send one of their rivals or enemies a head on a platter. And this is, this is so the, the EU gets to say that things are being done over there. Reform is being done, send another billion dollars that we desperately need at home to the Albanian drug lords. This is the situation uh, that we have. This is the paper that I gave to um, the American Nationalist Union conference. It's extremely depressing, and I like talking about Albania because it just it's it's funny, but not it's funny only in the sense that you just have to laugh, or else you'll be very upset. I have been understating the problem here. It's actually far worse. Um, it's really uh, one of the first, or really only times in modern times where you could actually show where drug lords have taken over a government. Here it was in the early 90s. The pyramid schemes collapsed. Uh, the money laundering schemes collapsed. The rioting took place. The rioting actually was led by the gangs that took over all the old communist um, uh, housing, government offices, and the old magazines that uh, Mao's China had established throughout Albania in case of a Soviet invasion that never came. And having taken all those weaponry, all that weaponry, they replaced it with an army that's not really an army. All it is are three or four major transport planes. Uh, why transport? Well, that's a, a stupid question. You know why. No tanks, no helicopters, no nothing. Nothing that could ever challenge them. So look, outside of a foreign invasion, nothing can be done. The parties that everyone knows, including Albanians, are being voted for in every election. Everyone knows that they are uh, factions of the drug lords, but people participate in these elections. If you participate in Albanian elections, you're saying that it's okay. So they're in on it. If anything, they're upset that they're not a part of it more. And they brag about it there because it's a macho thing. The collapse of the, of the communist state created a, a total vacuum. There was no religion. Uh, it was a total moral vacuum. No one knew that Albania was even there. So all the Pentecostals and Mormons, they, they went elsewhere. It was just simply a void. It really was a void. It's like a college campus. It's a total void. Um, and it was replaced by uh, drugs, uh, power, money. And, and, you know, with a big money comes in to a poverty-stricken place with no hope, these guys become popular. Everyone looks up to them. Uh, it doesn't matter if they sell heroin or not. Um, they're rich. They have the one Mercedes in the area. It's um, And it proves, of course, the point of all this. Russia is the only enemy. The U.S. has financed every speck of this. Every bit of this has been financed by the U.S. These groups don't function on their own. This is why heroin has flooded the United States over the last few years. I mean, it's always been a problem, but it's an epidemic now. Again, this is what the military is fighting for. I don't support the troops. You're the bad guys and you're on the wrong side. You're the villains here. Can't bond steal? You know, it's like Lex Luthor's lair. You are drug dealers. Anyone who doesn't desert their position is a criminal. The U.S. military is a criminal enterprise. Camp Bond Steel is proof. They are the, the bodyguard of the heroin trade coming through Kosovo. I've just proven it. 
in Serbia, in Russia, tried to fight it, and the Clinton administration bombed them. And uh, yeah, I've had enough. Anyway, thank you, my friends. Um, I'll talk to you next time.